but I still think it's it's valuable to say, no, we actually want stories, films, games, whatever, that anyone, regardless of their political persuasion, can sit down and really enjoy and talk about with other people. Um, because I guarantee, you know, there will be Marxists who really enjoyed the MCU, and there will be very right-wing conservatives who really enjoyed the MCU, and it's a point of similarity and commonality that they can sit down and stop arguing with each other just for a few minutes and start talking about, hey, Tony Stark was pretty great. Hello, culminators. Welcome to the program. Good to see you guys again. It has been a, a wild summer. And uh, for me, certainly. Uh, and I am glad to, to be to be back recording an episode. We had a, I had a little bit of a break, took a little bit uh, of a break uh, over the summer, though we kept the episodes coming uh, quite at the usual frequency, but just enough to keep you wanting more. I want to introduce you to someone that I have sort of met online. And uh, as you've heard me say so many times, you do sort of begin to think of yourself as meeting people that you actually don't know or meet ever, but you, you know, you, you communicate with them. Uh, as I have fallen down the rabbit hole of culture of, of cultural criticism focused on mass media, which I don't myself actually consume. I nonetheless find the topic fascinating and one of the channels that i have really come to appreciate is the little platoon which i'm showing you here on youtube and he's got a healthy 155,000 subscribers um and uh his name is benjamin mercer uh he's also on twitter if you must know that uh, beth i'm giving you a, pre a preview he's on twitter uh and like most guys uh on multiple platforms he does much better just like I do better on Twitter than do terrible on YouTube. Uh, usually the focus has to be in one place or the other, unless you're an absolute uh, rock star. Uh, not that to say the little platoon, uh, Benjamin isn't he. I, th I think he's fascinating. One of the things that I found particularly fascinating, as I was just telling him before we went on, is that he, his background is in aesthetics. Now, of course, everyone who knows me knows that aesthetics mean everything to me, everything. But I didn't know it was something that you could actually study academically. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And welcome to the show, Benjamin Mercer. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you, of course, are a real person, not only a um, an animated figure. Is that not correct? That is the rumor. Um, no one has yet been able to confirm it, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm told I do exist offline sometimes as well, but not as much as my mom would like me to because I keep missing events. But you know. So if you watch the program, uh, you'll see that, you know, when when Benjamin uh, breaks from, you know, actual clips of uh, movies that he's reviewing, when he's reviewing movies, that he, we we get this 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 animation, but when he's doing a, a live broadcast, I have just come to learn, we get this really cool kind of moving animation. And as someone who is himself basically a self parody at this point, I really appreciate <laughs> the, the, the entire. See, look, he laughed. It's great. Uh, you know, he's, he, he and he explained to us how he did it. And I maybe Jeremy took notes, but obviously I'm going to have to just drop whatever I'm doing and d do one for myself as soon as we're done recording this. Ben, how long have you been? Do you call yourself? Maybe you don't go by Ben. Is Ben okay? Is Benjamin? Is you prefer yeah, ben? no, no. Ben is fine. I, I always used to get asked that. It used to be Benjamin for writing purposes, but in conversation, it reminds me of being told off. So, um, so Ben is. Is, fine. <laughs> is, is that what your is that what your your mom or dad would say to you when you were in trouble? Oh yes, frequently. And and I bet you probably were. You seem to be a bit of an iconoclast. That's a, a word that I used a couple of minutes ago in a different context. Um. You do seem to have some very specific ideas about things. There are a number of, of excerpts that I, often I listen to these in the car, um, so I can't necessarily pull over to the road. But there, there are lots of little snippets like that that, that I have enjoyed that I've wanted to to clip. Um, you got a problem? You got an issue with women, Benjamin? 
Oh yeah, I, I'm a famous, famous misogynist. I, I I detest women. I was born from one, apparently, but I, I regret it at the moment I came out. But um, <laughs> no, no, it's uh, I have I have absolutely no problem with the ladies. I I love them being involved in things. Um, it's just that that was actually sort of the idea that goes behind much of that Barbie video is that the people who really have a problem with women are, tend to be other women, just as uh, Marxists really famously don't speak for the people they claim to speak for. They actually quite dislike the working class. So feminists quite dislike the choices that women make. Um, now, and to the extent and Barbie is a feminist film, then yeah, it doesn't really like other women. Very much. My wife has told me the same thing for years, that the, <laughs> women's biggest enemies are women. In fact, I once tried a wrongful um, termination case uh, successfully and well this was one of those trials where the judge lets you talk to the jury after the verdict is in and what they told me was oh this serbian croatian stuff whatever it was that wasn't that wasn't the animus it was two women who were competing in the, in in the office and that's why she fired the lady but putting that aside you mentioned politics uh you seem to be a bit of a uh bit of a right winger <laughs> um i don't know i i think i i see very limited use value anymore in this sort of left wing and, and right wing it's a little bit peculiar that we do still sort of measure our political opinions based on who sat on which side of the french monarch but um <laughs> yeah it's I, I, tell, I leave them to other people. They're inevitable. Labels are inevitable. I'm not one of those people who says that it's impossible to have labels and we should shirk all labels. I think that labels are an inevitable part of coming to know somebody, but I prefer to leave it to other people to decide for me. So I, I wouldn't call myself a right winger, but I'm sure some of my opinions will come across as right wing to some people. And it might very well be that in some of your videos that your opinions come across otherwise. I just haven't, I just haven't <laughs> found that yet. Although, I mean, you, you do, uh, tell us that that you're gay which make which right right there is an interesting perspective point for you because i think there was one video where you're explaining to people that that you, you were explaining why it, something wouldn't be the case believe me it's not this because it, i'm not like that and it couldn't I, do you remember what it was where you were explaining that um maybe it's happened more than once it's happened a few times um i think there was definitely she hulk I oh it yes, it was she. Yes. It was She Hulk. Yes, it's everyone's like you just favorite wants, punching it's, it's the usual. It's AOC's thing. So you, you just want to sleep with me if you criticize me, and it's like, well, actually, it's not going to be that because <laughs> right. um, for obvious reasons. But um, but uh, I, I do. I mentioned it a few times in the videos there, just because I think that it, it goes to the broader political sort of socio political point, which is that uh, unfortunately a lot of people on the right, and I have a large part of the audience which is on the political right. Uh, there I am using labels that I don't like, but there we are. Um, will probably only have any kind of exposure to so-called LGBT people via the so-called LGBT community, which is a absolutely terrible representative of any sexual minority. If there's one surefire way of, of breeding some kind of cultural backlash against gay rights, lesbian rights, bisexual, whatever the hell, um, yeah, putting the LGBT community front and center uh, and the antics of modern pride parades is a very, very good way to go about that. So trying to basically prove to people that we're not all like that is a, a, a an underpinning point for the mentions of gayness in the videos. Why is what's the little platoon? Maybe you maybe in an early video you explain the the meaning, but but I I never picked it up. Yeah, it's um it's actually a phrase of Edmund Burke's. Um, and, oh, but I'm not uh, a right winger. <laughs> <laughs> I think George Orwell used it once or twice as well. But um, uh, the, a little platoon in Burke's formulation is any kind of very small scale, organically formed sort of civic society organizations, so the bird watching society of West Minnesota or whatever, something which basically exists underneath the state, would exist independent of the state, and which people just naturally form so long as the government doesn't get involved and tell them that they can't. Um, so any kind of little platoon, what you do is arguably a form of little platoon. You build a community, it's organically grown, it's your own thing and it's a, people with shared interests getting together to talk about the things that they're they're interested in that's a kind of little platoon and it, it's it's an alternative to the overbearing sort of model of state intervention and and state mandates for absolutely everything so as opposed to uh, a government department which says you must go and watch birds it's the bird watchers of this particular district getting together and doing it for themselves well i think i think you're you're right that podcasts whether they're on youtube uh or other kinds of podcasts are little platoons. They are that sort of community 
that so far has been relatively unmolested by the increasingly grabby powers of the state. Of all the social media um, uh, censorship that we've experienced in the last few years in the UK and the US, certainly as, 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 as well as in other places, um, they've let people develop communities and have and talk about things that are not usually allowed to be spoken about in podcasts and i'm sure there are people who are very bothered by that mm -hmm. but your focus is more on, on 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 the big stuff the or at least from what i've seen you well you have a couple of other channels i see um what's lost court about so that's my second channel and it's basically a repository for other things that I don't have the time or the proper effort to put into in terms of video edit. So it's shorter reviews. There's some music on there, which I'd like to do more of as well, but it's it's just a repository for stuff that isn't it's on the main channel. All right, so what's, you mentioned in a, in a, in a video that you're, you're you, you, I think you were critiquing the, the, the nature of, I, I think it was the, the way films are being shot today, the, this, you know, the, the look Maybe it's to look for the Marvel universe, perhaps, uh, as you know, as it has come down to us at this point. You mentioned that you that you got your degree. I don't know if it was the degree or a degree or some degrees in the subject of aesthetics. What's that about? Where, where, where is that? A, is that a major that you can study in a lot of different a, a subject matter? You can get a degree in in a lot of different places. Um, it tends to be, and in my experience, was a derivative of philosophy. So I did my undergrad degree was in philosophy, religion and ethics, in which I specialized in aesthetics. Um, and then I did a master's in contemporary ethics, which, again, has a, a large aesthetic element to it as well. Um, then I went away and did journalism because ethics and journalism don't famously go together. So I thought I'll give it a go. But, um, but yeah, so aesthetics was the thing that I, I don't we don't do majors in this country, but I, I would assume it's the equivalent of my majors is the, the specialist subject within uh, the doctrine. of. of so so thing. so this is aesthetics, in, in other words, in the platonic sense of, of the word. That was actually, yeah, the, the subject of my undergrad dissertation, the question was, does art do us good? And if so, is that good a moral one? And it was basically various different examples extrapolating the argument between Aristotle and Plato about the point and purpose and nature of art as catharsis, for example, bloodletting of emotions and things like that. So, yeah, Plato's theories of, of art are definitely a big part of that. It's one of the areas that I did look at. And what's the answer? <laughs> uh, I'm more with Aristotle on that one. I don't I don't really like exiling poets from republics very much. I think poets yeah. probably, we don't really know exactly what we want to do with them, but it's good to have a few of them around. Um, whereas, yeah, Plato's idea was essentially boiled down. Uh, art misleads people because it's, it has a cathartic effect, because it encourages emotional bloodletting effectively. Um, and because Homer in particular, who he didn't like very much, was pointing people toward false gods, art was a very, very important tool in the misleading of the public away from the moral good and the perfect republic. Whereas Aristotle said, if you don't allow people to have emotional bloodletting via the arts, then they will probably go and bloodlet in some more physical way. Um, and therefore, it's probably a good thing. It's the origin of the term catharsis, I think. Um, so I'm more with Aristotle on that. I think art's a really good way of encouraging people to explore emotions that they otherwise wouldn't get to do in a way which is not necessarily going to impact other people in a negative way. Although I, I think we can see, uh, certainly in the, in the modern state, how art can be uh, allied with power mm. in a way that is... That may actually very well serve that purpose that you just mentioned, which is to give people that opportunity for a sort of um, psychological, satis you know, resolution of issues, catharsis, as it may be. Um, but at the same time, it, it could it could still do that, but also prevent legitimate exp what are actually legitimate or unapproved explorations mm. of those suppressed needs and desires. I mean, I'm thinking of Stalin's St Stalin was not anti-art. He, 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 fa he fancied himself a bit of a poet. He was very interested in literature, very, very well read um, and very interested in promoting Soviet art, but there were very specific 
ideological requirements for what that art should be. Uh, it, like there, there's no absolute. I mean, there are absolutes, but we can't say. Would we definitely? Would we necessarily say that some art? It's better to have some art than no art at all in a society. Or would we say only if there is a relatively free um, range for ex artistic expression that it's worth it? Do you, do you hear yeah. my where I come from on the question? I do, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a good point as well. That all it's a backhanded compliment to art in a way that all dictatorships have a view about what art should be, and there is always going to be permissible and impermissible art. Um, the, the difference will be between and even Plato did that. Plato didn't get rid of all the art from his Republic. It was mimetic artists and poets very specifically because they misled people. But officially sanctioned art, which gives people the right moral message, that's all fine. Which is not dissimilar to the, the state of affairs we now find ourselves in. Um, and all dictatorships throughout history have always done this. Mao also thought he was a poet. The Nazis had big exhibitions of banned art and, and art that was set for destruction. Um, you had the bonfire of the vanities uh, back in, in uh, uh, Florence, I think that was, in the is that 1600s. Um, yeah, they, everyone who ever wants to control anyone understands that controlling the means of artistic production and the messages that people take from art is a very, very good place to start. Uh, um, means of artistic society... production. I, that, that, I, I picked <laughs> that up. That was good. Okay. And subtle old Marxist training comes in there. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's an important part in any kind of system of social control. The, the healthy society is one where art can tell politicians things about themselves. And the unhealthy society is where politicians use art to tell people things that they think they need to hear. And that's kind of where we are at the moment, I think, that this huge nexus between the corporations, which, of course, own the mass means of mass production, mass production culture, Disney, for example. Um, but there's a, there's a big nexus between those and sort of acceptable and unacceptable political opinions and opinions that the studios themselves are in effect paid to push via metrics like, you know, environmental social governance and things like that, which all bleed into artistic production. Art then must say something approved to the audience. And the audience picks up on this, which is why the audience is fast disappearing for lots of these different things um, and flocking to other lesser known productions. Um, is it Sound of Freedom is the big one that came out quite recently. So, um, I mean, that that is an absolute an, a paradigm buster. Uh, and it, it goes back to, to, to this, you know, uh, evergreen concept that you can, you, you can't, well, well, as Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and given, you know, and, and after all, what we're seeing going on with Disney, and I've been very busy with, with uh, Valiant Renegade, part of the crew of guys like you who do this on YouTube talking about modern culture and with a special interest on Disney, which is so dominant in modern culture. Um, this idea, you can't just keep, the, 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 I think they had reached a point where they thought that they were like a monopoly. They were like a government. The only way you, the public would take what it was served and like it to which the public has said, we don't like it and we're not taking it and we're not, we're not paying for it. Has that surprised you? Um, a little, well, yes and no. I think yes in, in terms of the speed of all of this and, and how very quickly it came to a head. Knowing that corporations and big companies, especially when they, they come anywhere near a monopoly position, and if you've majored in economics, I mean, you know all the flaws of monopolies, but don't ever underestimate the, the ability for companies to do the most destructive thing possible to their own reputation. Um, nothing quite erodes sense like money. And they were swimming in money for a good long while during the pandemic because they had you know, ultra low interest rates, very cheap borrowing, huge uh, influx of, of money into streaming services and all the rest of that. And everything looked pretty swanky for them. Um, and then they just assumed that the theme parks would bounce back. That didn't happen. The money's getting tight. The uh, interest rates are going up. It's harder to borrow and debts are coming due. And all of a sudden now you're seeing them maybe try and row back on some of the very silly things they did sort of 2020 through 2022. Um, cutting back on some productions, uh, maybe a quietening of some of the political rhetoric as well. Um, but yeah, it might be a bit too late for them, reputation-wise, but uh, it's it's a reaction to their um, initial stupidity, which was, I mean, I don't know. It's I don't know if it's fair to say that I was actually entirely unsurprised by it, um, just because if you went back even to 2019, everything seemed for the most part, pretty healthy with Disney. Um, you had the Marvel Cinematic Universe was sort of 
okay just about it was about to start its big very dr uh, rapid and dramatic decline um but it, you know it, it wraps up pretty nicely with avengers endgame it made many billions of dollars and in a very very short period of time you suddenly had the massive collapse of, of many intellectual properties um which disney had bought up very expensively and relied upon to to keep its profit uh, profits looking pretty healthy for the duration if you told me in 2000 and when did disney buy lucasfilm that was 2012 i think was it if you told me anyway basically a decade ago that within a decade uh star wars would be losing money indiana jones would be losing money marvel would be losing money everything would be losing money and all because or at least in large part because every single writer disney employed seemed to want to tell people what to think politically as opposed to telling stories I probably wouldn't have believed you. I don't think I could have envisioned the time when Star Wars, of all things, lost money. But here we are. And it reminds me of, of, of a, an, I don't want to call it an argument, but of all people, I had Vivek Ramaswamy on the program a couple of years ago. Which, Everybody. And he has offered to come back on. Um, and he, his, in his, the book that he put out a couple of years ago, he was, he had argued, Woke Inc., that, um, I think that was what it was that uh, these major companies, these public companies do these sort of uh, counterintuitive and apparently irrational forms of submission to wokeness, as we call it, uh, entirely rationally that there's, that they're not doing anything irrational. It's exactly, it, it does benefit stockholders and, Given my background, and I don't have an MBA as he does, I just have an undergraduate. In fact, where I went to college, it was not called uh, a a major. It was called a concentration, probably being, you know, old-fashioned kind of guys over at Princeton. Um, but to my thinking, that's it seemed really irrational. It seemed, it seemed that it could not be justifiably, no matter how much you think it makes sense to do it because of where the cultural tides are taking you, it can't be good for sales for Victoria's Secrets to use plus size models. That has to be bad. For, it has to be bad for sales because the intuitive, you, just as you make superheroes strong and decisive and pretty much male because that works with our wiring, that works with our, you know, you want to change culture. That's fine. That's a, that's an interesting project. But if you want to maximize profit in an entertainment industry that's changing the wiring is not is not going to be the the job job one it might be something that you have as a side project or something as you have but it seems to me that disney is proving the go woke go broke uh you know uh trope <laughs> as they say that you know people really just especially at these prices uh, you can't just keep coasting on brand equity more, forever. No, you can't. Um, and I, but I do wonder. So there is an argument to be made for, say, wokeness, um, which is that, and it's a broad term. Uh, so maybe getting a, a bit more specific. Um, one of the arguments will be, for instance, that actually it does make sound economic sense to do this kind of thing. Um, because, well, you do want to encourage people, investors in particular, outside investors, to think that you're doing a really good, socially conscious, environmentally positive and well-governed job. If you're looking to get most of your inward investment from outside investments, uh, outside investors, sorry, who really want to be seen to be scoring quite highly ESG wise. Right. If then... investor, if that if investors have that as a as a desideratum, agreed. Now, historically, that's not what an investor did, but now we do have a world of institutional investors that do do that. Yeah, Check. and it's all okay. a little bit of a racket because they, you will you will outperform an ESG because you have to be an ESG in order to make money. It's a, a it's a slightly cartelish behavior, but um, but then the problem will always come when when it actually comes to delivering something back to investors in terms of product. So then you get to the point where, well, okay, can I possibly balance? the sales prospectus for my investor with the products that my customer actually wants. And in some cases, you can do that. Barbie did that incredibly well because Barbie understood its target audience. Barbie understood that it was basically marketed at upper middle class, middle to upper middle class women, professional women, 
uh, mostly probably single women, it must be said as well. Um, and actually, the messaging that Barbie in includes is completely of a piece with what its target audience demands. So though it seemed to go woke, it made over a billion dollars quite comfortably and was very popular. By contrast, when Bud Light says to its target audience that we're going to start rewarding trans women, for instance, and its own executive director says something along the lines of, our audience is a little bit too much like frat boys, well, then you're starting to tell people things they don't really want to hear. They want to drink inexplicably bad beer, but um, they don't want to be lectured to politically. So like <laughs> in that instance, yep, go woke and you go broke. But in, in Barbie's case, no, go woke and you'll make a lot of money. It does seem that Barbie played it just right. Mm. Um, apparently, and I, you know, I, don't, I don't really tend to go to the movies. If it weren't for air travel, I would probably never see any movies. But... What I gather from from the reviews is that, I mean, look, there there are some people on social media, including some admitted right wingers. I, I think uh, Michael Knowles was one who said, "I think Barbie worked. I think Barbie worked. I think I, I think that I I get it. I I, I see where 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 it's coming from." Um, do you think, to some extent, there is a, 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 a too much of a willingness among the critics of the? you know, the Hollywood critics on this sort of topic that to, to uh, give the, the opposite of the benefit of the doubt to filmmakers, assume that they don't, that they're not, for example, Velma mm. appears to be so over the top and so meta that when I look at these snippets, it's, I, I do think that perhaps they're actually making fun of what they are because it can't it really be the way it's being presented to me. But almost every single reviewer from this crowd, and I like to watch them all, um, that has discussed that program has failed to find the parody or the or even the you know the meta ness of it, or 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 at least the uh, the intended meta ness of the meta 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 ness. You see where see where where I'm coming from in that. I do, yeah, and um, it's 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 annoying because you like to cling to this idea of death of the author when it comes to evaluating any particular work of art. The the idea that actually it should be understood completely irrespective of the intentions of the person behind it. Oh, thank um, you, for, thank you, everyone. Please listen. You scroll back. <laughs> This is how we understood arts and literature in particular until just a, just about, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You read a work. You don't have to understand where the person who wrote it or, or, or created it came from, what they were, how they're experienced. You read a work. You're allowed to get it off the shelf, open it up and start reading it. And that's your reading experience that you might be fascinated with the person. You might want to learn more about it after you've read it, or you might know about it before you pick it up, but it is not, if it has to come with instructions, it has failed. Yes. And Please annoyingly, proceed. it's a function of, of quite political art, which is that it, it does require this rebirth of the author. Because when, I mean, Barbie is a, is a good example. Barbie and Velma sort of approach it in different ways. But in Barbie's case, because there were certain moments in it which seems like they were parodying, uh, quote unquote woke feminism. Lots of people said, don't you see, it is meta and it is satire. And if you completely disregarded the author, you could look at it and you could say, yeah, it can't possibly be sincere about this, can it? Because it's so, it's so obviously ridiculous. But then you, because people are making a very definitive claim about it, Barbie is satire, you think, well, uh, that's a question of intent. It's pushing a political point. Is it or is it not sincere about the political point? I'm going to have to ask Greta Gerwig, the director and the writer, what she was actually intending behind it. You go away and you find out that, lo and behold, it wasn't satire. It was just so unself-aware that it seemed like that. And the same thing was true of Velma. Velma was, because, yeah, you're right, it was so meta and it was so on the nose. And you, you looked at it and you thought, you can't actually believe this stuff. That like, You <laughs> must be parodying something. But then you go back and you, you read anything Mindy Kaling said about it or you look at any of the interviews behind it and you find nothing to actually convince you that she didn't uh, mean everything she was saying in that. It just looked parodic because to anyone not in that particular Hollywood mindset, of course, Velma is ridiculous. Um, but the Hollywood mindset is a, is a bit of a brain bug and I think Mindy Kaling got it. 
let me change the channel a little bit here as we uh, round the bend into the uh, closing minutes of our discussion. I'm talking to an animation. I mean, I'm talking to a real person, but I'm looking at you as an animation. And it just occurs to me that so much of the programming that we're talking about, programming and production, <laughs> is either animation or based on animation. Comic mm -hmm. books or classic movie cartoons like Snow White turned into live action or cartoons for grown-ups. You're an esthete. What's going on here? <laughs> oh, a number of things. Um, so, uh, well, beginning with the, the, the live action remake things, in Disney's case, or anyone who's taking, say, Snow White and, and remaking it, that is simply creative bankruptcy. It was old, it was popular, uh, and we need money. So, here, <laughs> let, let's hire some relatively new actors, Rachel Ziegler, for example, hope that she doesn't open her mouth on social media. And and we'll make we'll make buck. We did it before. It worked with Cinderella. It worked with Beauty and the Beast. It worked less with The Lion King. It worked even less again with The Full Moment. It's going downhill. But that that's just because they can't create new things. But there are other examples where where animation is taking off and is incredibly popular because actually it's doing daring, new, and innovative things. Uh, the reason manga sales, for example, now massively outstrip comic book sales is that in comics you're seeing really just what movies will be in 10 years time it, it's even more hyper politicized because the audience is so small and because the money value is now so little they think well this is where we can just put anyone with any any kind of idea let's hire tiny easy codes to write black panther that would be a good idea um no one will read it anyway so i'm not going to lose any cash uh so comics is, is is going very much further down the political route than movies and is losing the audience whereas manga is completely or largely um, uninfiltrated by that sort of thing. It's still telling old-fashioned stories with good characters, quite dark stories very often, but very creative new ideas. And people actually want that kind of thing. Then when some of them become quite popular, they come over to the West and inevitably some big studio decides, hey, let's make it live action. And it doesn't do very well. But the manga itself is still worth watching. And then on the, the there's a third strand as well, which is uh, sort of the, the reanimation of other properties. Arcane, for instance, was a very, very good animated series, which is based on a video game. And most video game films and derived media aren't very good. Um, but Arcane, because it wasn't really looked for, because no one up in charge said, this would be a good vehicle to push a particular kind of message. They just turned it over to someone who really liked the property and thought, I really want to tell a story with these characters. Lo and behold, because there's no messaging in it, like, on, well, no untoward messaging in it, it comes out, it's very diverse. It's got a lesbian lead character. It's It's got a, a hugely diverse cast. And it's incredibly popular with everyone because no one is sitting there telling you that the reason the lesbian character is a lesbian is because we need to see more lesbians on the screen politically. It's because, no, it just fit the character. Um, and people actually really liked it. Arcane's a really good refutation of all those people who say you only hate diversity because you're basically a closet, racist, homophobe, whatever. It's like, no, I don't like forced diversity when it's intruding upon story. I really like it when there's proper good representation in good stories and characters that I can aspire to be or emulate or feel on behalf of or empathize with. Um, and that sort of animation is taking off for exactly the same reason as manga is more popular than comics and for exactly the reason that Disney's live action remakes are unpopular by comparison. I think, if that's not too much of a bundled answer to that question. No, well, it, it, it's a question that, in, that, in, that impl implicates a lot of different strands of content as we call it these days so i understand why it's not a simple why it's not a simple answer um it does just seem that um you know i was discussing with a valiant this question of the antitrust complaint or not i'm sorry report that's why that's why i'm using the scare quotes because it, I, as i said to him if you if they really had an antitrust claim the the, the actors uh, the writers guild or the writers uh, union would they would have filed it as a complaint. They would have a legal claim and they would make it. But issuing a report is a way of, you know, if you if you if you're in, you know, a major institution, so you you will get some ink for it. Making accusations that you don't really have to back up. But we do see him. I mean, look for you for all its censoriousness. Uh, here's YouTube, running your program and running uh, Nerdrotic. And, you know, all these other uh, people who Hollywood likes to blame for 
bad box office. Do you think there, you, you know, the claims that there's a monopoly that there is, I, we, we both alluded before to the sort of monopolistic business model in the sense that they, you know, the big studios seem to think, you know, we're, we're serving it and you're going to eat it. But as a practical matter, there are, it seems to me that there are so many ways to distribute content now and so many places to do so. And you've got a sub stack um, and you're on YouTube. I don't think there's really a successful claim of monopoly unless you're limiting what we call the, you know, the, the market that's being constrict, constrained to a, a rather artificial uh, definition, which is m movies that are seen in movie theaters with $20 popcorn. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question of mindset on the part of the studios themselves, because I, I think that the difference in mindset between Disney and Apple, for example, is, is I think quite an illustrative one. Disney wants a monopoly. Um, that's part of the reason they bought up so many studios, they put out so many films, and almost any given big budget production in the cinema, there's a good chance it's going to be Disney, because Disney is made it that way. Disney thinks like an old company, it's old enough to desire monopoly. And it bought up so many studios that it didn't really know what to do with, on the assumption that, well, fans would have no choice but to see a Disney film, because Disney basically owns everything. Whereas Apple is building its own streaming service, it's getting very slowly, but cautiously but also quite deliberately into mass media these days apple tv is is well, it's not making a profit yet but it probably will soon and they want to expand it to theater productions as well um and apple doesn't it seems to me want that monopoly it's not an old company in the way that disney does it's not so set in its ways and it's not so old as to make that that classic mistake of old companies which is that we will grow and grow and grow and then we'll own everything and then people will have no choice. Apple, because it's a new company, because it's always had a huge amount of competition from other tech companies, understands, I think, still, that monopolies are unattainable. And even if you get one temporarily, you will lose it. And the, the answer to earning people's affection isn't to give them no choice, but it's to give them more choice. And Disney doesn't get that. Disney thinks that having no choice but to see a Disney production is a good thing. Apple says, well, we're not actually going to buy up new studios. We're going to do very few but quite well-made independent original productions. And this will be giving people more choice and people will see the quality of the thing. They'll see that they're not getting it from other mass-produced content manufacturers like Disney. So they'll slowly but surely come over to our way of thinking. And it seems to be working for them. They haven't splurged uh, an unaffordable amount of money on studios which they now can't make a profit from. Um, and they are doing new things which are perhaps unlooked for. Silo, for example, was a very good, well, it was a, it was a pretty good adaptation of a, a relatively small series of books which just finished on Apple TV. And it's flawed, but it's much better than any given Disney production is going to be these days. Whereas Disney looked at it and said, well, everyone likes Star Wars, everyone watches Star Wars, so we'll just buy it and everything will fall into place. Um, that's not quite what happened. but. Uh, yeah, the mindset difference, I think, between the, these older legacy companies and the companies which came up in sort of the tech burst is still on display. And I think that will play out for a longer period of time as well. Disney is is very much set in its ways. And but you consume a lot of a lot of media content. Uh, I try to. Yeah, it's uh... you try to. Is that what's best for a man? I mean, you're a philosopher. D do you ever say to yourself, I sure do a lot of spectating. And, is, is, and, you know, does, does that ever seem to you that being, of course, if you make it your profession or you make it your way of making a living, then you sort of answered the question. But as, a, you know, there is so much talk about we live, we live in, a, in, in a society of abundance. Peaks and valleys notwithstanding, we will both go to sleep with out empty stomachs tonight. Um, thank God. What is, do you think we're, there's too much talk and too much attention on consumption of media products? The, the ever, does that ever occur to you? It does, but then if you look back throughout history, you know, a huge amount of our fondest collective memories come from mass media. There's a reason things like Star Wars are so very well known and very well loved, is because they are a shared experience. And that, shared was experience a long, that was a long, that was... A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it was indeed. And it's getting longer and longer every day. Um, <laughs> but but I, 
the reason I, I bring that up, though, is because I, I take the point that there can be overemphasis on, on consuming media and maybe an overemphasis on, on the bad stuff. And maybe people aren't talking enough about things they've seen, which are good. But it, there's, it's, there's, you know, the, the classic argument is, well, if you just go to the film festival, you'll see all these brilliantly brilliant independent creators doing brand new things. Like, yeah, OK, that's it's a fair point. But the audience for those is about 50 people in the room. And I'm slightly more interested in, in, in mass media because mass media is by definition the thing that everyone can make common reference to. The reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe was so well loved for such a long time is because everyone went to see it. And so when you're talking to people about things, it's a point of commonality. We share stories. Some of the greatest stories in human history are the most popular ones, not the least popular ones. The Bible, if, if you don't believe it's literally true, the Bible is one of the most fantastic collections of folk tales, of folk myths and memories that everyone understands by reference. As a piece of literature, if I may be forgiven, I'm still astonished. I'm astonished at the brilliance of the Bible uh, as a, as literature. So I, I agree with you. Uh, in other words, this is how we can, this is our, this is how, how we as, a, as, as, as a world community or as community, this, that, or the other one tell our stories. And I guess to some extent, fill our souls. Yeah. And how you form communities as well. I mean, it, we're always talking these days about how very divided culture seems to be. And certainly along political lines, um, it's it's uh, it's true in this country. I think it's probably more true in the United States at the moment. But there is this lack of common narrative. And there's, there's a lack of mutually shared assumptions and values. And mass media is a good way of propagating those. It's, it's not necessarily you want mass media to tell you what to think. Because mass media is as much a representation of something as it is uh, a conveyor of, of truth and information. Um, so it's it fulfills two functions, but I still think it's it's valuable to say, you no, know, we actually want stories, films, games, whatever, that anyone, regardless of their political persuasion, can sit down and really enjoy and talk about with other people. Um, because I guarantee, you know, there will be Marxists who really enjoyed the MCU. And there will be very right wing conservatives who really enjoy the MCU. And it's a point of similarity and commonality that they can sit down and stop arguing with each other just for a few minutes and start talking about, hey, Tony Stark was pretty great. And then the right. Marxists will inevitably say, yeah, but he was a billionaire, so we really should have liquidated him. But even so, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's and, an important sociological function. And also go going back to that debate between uh, Plato and Aristotle, you're, you get to play out these moral dilemmas, these questions, the, you know, if, it, if, if it's done right without actually having to experience moral dilemmas and unique, uh, you know, character challenges, we can see or tell uh, of people going through these things and grow, grow from it. There's no question that, you know, that there's... Uh, you know, a, a life without any form of art would indeed be indeed be very much like, I guess it would be like Bill Gates, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> I want to thank you. I think that I could probably pick your brain on this stuff uh, for hours and hours, but, but you are uh, a, a busy man and, uh, and I'm really grateful for you spending time just letting me bounce this stuff off you. Uh, I, I don't think there's any way for me to, to really fit this into my, into my uh, professional interests. I don't think there's really a a, sen, a, a, sen, a a censorship issue or anything like that. Not not, not one that we discussed, but uh, people should definitely I, uh, pay attention to what you're saying. You're, you're you have a, a truly interesting, and I, I'm sure you've heard the word "droll" applied to your style before. And guess what? It is absolutely delightful. If, you know. You know, old conservatives like me who remember William F. Buckley with I want to want to call it an affected British accent because apparently there was it was not affected. But that sort of style of uh, people, I think, will get a kick out of it. But also your insights are tremendous. You have an unusual unlike unlike most people who are sounding off on these topics. You have really thought and studied deeply into much of what they're about. So um, I think, folks, you'll enjoy the little platoon. And I thank you very much, Benjamin, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great fun. And I will always take all comparisons with William Buckley. Uh, <laughs> you right-wing nut. All right. <laughs> so long. Thank you.